Hi, I'm Susan Platt, and I'm calling my podcast Platitudes. Hear me roar. So today, I'm with Leslie Coburn, who is a renowned investigative journalist. She's a mom. She's a grandmom. She's a conservationist. She is uh, everything that modern-day women would love to aspire to be, and now she's a congressional candidate, Democratic congressional candidate in the 5th Congressional District of Virginia, running for an open seat. So, Leslie, thank you so much for, for being with me today. Thank you, Susan. Um, the title of my blog is Platitudes, Find Your Roar. What's your roar? Well, remember, I was an investigative journalist for 35 years. So I've been roaring for a very long time. And it's not so different. Uh, you know, it's very unusual for people to jump from journalism into politics. I had a little period in between, but what really happened was um, Trump came to power. That had a huge impact on me because I could foresee some serious problems with our entire political system and what could happen in Washington. And then also, don't forget, he started talking about journalists as the enemy of the people. Well, I certainly started roaring at that point because that, to me, was a disgrace. He crossed a serious line there because there is no democracy without journalism. So it was, um, my roar has always been a sense of outrage. And uh, where I've seen that you know, through my journalistic career, what would happen is I would come across a story and it would be so awful what was happening to people. And the idea of giving them a voice and, and exposing it was um, the absolute impetus I needed. So, uh, but being, for example, when I was at 60 Minutes, you had a really big roar because if I put a story on the air, the next morning I could walk into any coffee shop and people would be discussing that story. So for example, I found out that um, the National Guard was uh, having to go on patrol around Baghdad in Humvees with no armor on the bottom. So they were getting blown up in large numbers and um, I got together with the guard and we exposed this because they were unnecessarily killing people in these vehicles when you can up armor a vehicle like that and that is exactly what they did. We were part of the, the whole pressure on the Pentagon to do that. So we saved lives and it Absolutely. was it was it was great and we all I got in trouble for it, the guard got in trouble for it. But in the end, this is a really important thing. Um, I've done stories on a major car manufacturer that put a gas tank in the wrong place so that kids in the back seat caught fire in accidents. These things are it gives you a, a real sense of outrage and definitely makes you roar. So Trump came to power. Um, journalists were suddenly the enemies of the people. Uh, we had a, we were hearing about fake news. I live in Rappahannock County, and Rappahannock is not too far from Washington. It's very rural, but full of people who a lot of people who have been in government, who've been in journalism, who really. Uh, know a lot about what's going on in politics and people were angry and upset about this whole notion of fake news. So we started talking and agitating and then a couple of local chairs said, would you consider running for Congress? I'd never thought of running for Congress, but it made sense. I got in the car with my notebooks and started driving around this district, which is 10,000 square miles. It's big. It's big. It's really big. But once you, once you do that, I did that for three months and realized that I could do a lot of, I could really be helpful here. That we have a congressman right now who has bowed out of the race, but he really is a mini Trump. Right. And Freedom Caucus, so someone like me coming in, just uh, a much more reasonable person, I'd say, than, than this ho extremely hard right. We, we, been seeing in this area. So you found your roar, and you probably found it a number of different times, as I, I think it develops over time, but lots of folks that I talked to, and even for me, there was a moment in our childhood or in our young adulthood that we felt the stirrings of that roar. 
Can you go back to a moment where you thought about either being an investigative journalist, uh, exposing corruption, exposing the wrongs that, that hurt and affect people? Was there one moment that you can point to and say, this is what helped determine a large portion of my life? Well, I was, I, there were, I have two siblings, so there were three of us. I was the one at the dinner table, I'm the youngest, <laughs> who argued with my dad. <laughs> so I, my parents were Republican, but not Republicans like we're seeing today. They were Rockefeller Republicans. It's a whole different breed. It's extinct now. But I had those political conversations from very early on. Um, and I loved backing things up, and I loved fighting about ideas. And I really, my, my positions really haven't changed that much since I was about 12 years old. What did you, what did you do when you were a child? Did you, did you, what were your toys you played with? Well, I, I had some dolls, uh -huh. but really what I loved doing, I was a very, I was a tomboy. I Me mean, too. I, I was an outdoor person. Um, I loved exploring. Mm -hmm. I explored where I grew up. There were lots of creeks. It was, uh, there was a lot of wilderness. And um, so I spent a lot of time doing that. And I have to hand it to my parents in that they let us do that kind of thing, mm -hmm. which a lot of parents don't do that now. So I could go off and wander off you know, miles down these creeks. Um, I loved, I was very interested in, in uh, insects and wildlife. I loved a particular passion for butterflies, so I could wander off forever looking for butterflies. So I was a really an outdoor person and very um, athletic. Um, so that was me. I, you know, when you say, what was the first thing that really gave you your roar? I think it was the realization that girls were being treated differently from boys. How? In the sense of, um, you should let him win. You know, don't always win because you're the girl. That kind of notion of, uh, uh, well, eventually the main thing you want to do is find a good husband, as opposed to uh, be president of the United States. And uh, so it was that sense, and I was one of the first women at Yale. So mm -hmm. I was in the second class. There were very few of us. In my class, there were a 1,000 guys, and I think w there were about 125 of us. We were all in one dorm. And my, do my room was on the ground floor, so I could crawl in and out the window, which was great. <laughs> uh, but that, that sense of, um, uh, don't forget, it wasn't till my senior year in college, in 1974, that women could actually get a loan without co-signing. Credit card, mm -hmm. bank loan, business loan. And that really was a, a critical point. Because without that, how can you flourish as an as a adult in this society? So those sorts of things, and when I went into the, uh, the business of television news, there was a few women just above me, a little older, who had literally fought to wear pants in the office. To not That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. So you talked about your uh, love of being out, outside, which of course you talk about when you were on the Piedmont Environmental Council. And right now in the fifth particularly, there's a battle going on with the pipelines. There is indeed. And I, before I decided to run for Congress, I was on the board of the Piedmont Environmental Council for 10 years. And that organization, which covers uh, nine counties in the Piedmont, was one of the organizations in the state that was very involved in pipeline battles, power line battles, uranium mining battles. And all of that experience of uh, going through those fights will really serve me well now because the fights, of course, are back again. Uranium mining is now in front of the Supreme Court. They'll hear it. They'll hear those arguments. Um, Mark Herring will be doing that on November 5th. Very critical south side of this district. And the pipelines, um, you know, we've been fighting pipelines for a long time here. But these two particular pipelines I see as completely unnecessary for Virginia. They don't keep the lights on in Virginia. They are barreling through sustainable farms, whole communities. I um, am on an absolute soapbox about Buckingham County because the Atlantic Coast Pipeline will include a giant compressor station in the middle of Union Hill, 
which is an um, American, African American historic community. This is a community where people settled as soon as they could uh, farm their own land at the end of the Civil War and some who were freedmen before, but their descendants are still there. Mm -hmm. This is a tight community. People come, they go off to work elsewhere, they come and retire here. If you have a giant compressor station in the middle of it, it's spewing toxic chemicals. It is venting methane, which is 25 times worse than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. And it sounds like a diesel locomotive is right next to you seven days a week. So those fighting for people in Union Hill makes me roar. So what happens to those farmers and their farmland? In Union Hill? Oh, mm -hmm. In and around the pipelines. Well, I mean, we have a case of Four Corners Farm, for example, down in Franklin County. That's, that's multi-generational, that farm. The pipeline's gonna go through their back pasture. It's gonna go right next to their water source, to the creek. They're gonna have to sell. And that's one of the best sustainable farms in Franklin County. I'll tell you, it's, it's a little bit intimidating sitting here and trying to interview a little bit because you're such a award-winning investigative journalist. So let me ask you, if you were me, what would you ask you? Oh, I don't know. I can't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, I, I think I'd ask, what are you finding out there on the campaign trail? And I think what really is, people say you must be exhausted, how do you keep going? And what keeps me going is every stop I make, something surprising happens. Like, for example, about this uranium fight. In Pennsylvania County, I went to a meeting in an African-American neighborhood the other night, and there was a member of the Board of Supervisors there, and what they are already thinking about is if that mining goes ahead, how do they cope with birth defects? I'm endlessly coming up against a situation like that where you just say, wow, we really need to fight on this one. So, um, and also, you know, I mean, I, I live on a farm in Rappahannock, mm -hmm. so I'm very uh, sympathetic, empathetic with farmers around the district. I care about land use issues. I care about conservation issues. I, I know the issues that they care about in the farm bill. And, but to be with some of these guys, and uh, there's one family, for example, in Campbell County. They, they are dairy farmers. It's a four-generation dairy farm. And to be with the senior member is that, of that. Is this Carter Elliott? Yeah. Yes. And young Carter Elliott is working with us yeah. on the campaign. He, right. he, one day, he will be governor of Virginia. But hey, he, Carter. <laughs> but his grandfather, um, so astute, said, look, said, you know, Campbell County, over half the kids in Campbell County are so hungry that if they don't get that free meal at school, right. they're not getting enough to eat. If they don't get enough to eat, then uh, you know, he, we were talking about the SNAP program uh -huh. and how the administration wants to take a million people off of SNAP. Right. So if those kids don't get enough to eat, they can't learn. If they can't learn, where is the place of a Campbell County child in the American dream? And I was thinking, you know, this man is in his 70s. He's a Democrat, but quite conservative. And but he's thinking about the kids of Campbell County and how we cannot just live for ourselves and our cows, we have to really think about what's going on around us. And in those kinds of farms too, they're employing immigrants. Mm -hmm. You know, who's, who's milking the cows right. three times a day? And that's the same with poultry. Uh, we talk about, you know, the Trump administration has been telling us these people are criminals, that they're infesting our country. We don't have immigrant labor in the fifth district and respect these people. We don't have an economy. Let's talk about health care for a minute. Um, you know, they're talking about repealing all of Obamacare, and some even Republicans are now saying we need to protect pre-existing conditions and in, in insurance. What is it we can do? Well, for the children and for, there is a problem, I know, in this district, all across the country, and all across Virginia, of opioid addiction. That is, many people across Virginia know I lost my stepdaughter, my husband's here, um, to addiction, oh, which, which cost us almost everything we had in addition to her life. How are we going to help these people? It's all interconnected, our livelihoods, our health care, our land. How are we going to help them with 
mental health, physical health, insurance, making sure we, that, that people don't lose their houses and their farms to try to save their child's life. Well, you've just wrapped up all the important issues of the fifth because health care is by far the number one. I'll go to opioid addiction in just one second. You know, if you get rid of the Affordable Care Act, which is what my opponent wants to do, he's declared it, he wants to repeal the ACA. If you do it, you, we no longer have protection for people with pre-existing conditions. That was the backbone of the ACA. That's why we have it. If you get rid of it, an insurance company can just say to you, I'm sorry you have diabetes, or you had cancer, or you had severe migraines, we will not give you insurance. When I ask crowds in the fifth, raise your hand if you don't have a pre-existing condition, nobody raises their hand. Maybe one person in a crowd. Mm -hmm. We all have pre-existing conditions. The Republicans have now realized that they are losing on this issue and they're starting to say, oh, we're gonna repeal the ACA, but we're gonna take care of you with a pre-existing condition. Those two things don't go together because the Freedom Caucus, and my opponent has pledged to join the Freedom Caucus, what they insisted, they insisted that with any Republican health bill, the, the, the idea that you would automatically guarantee insurance to people with pre-existing conditions was gutted. They insisted that that be gutted. So they are not going to protect people with pre-existing conditions. So why do, you, why do you think they're called the Freedom Caucus? Why, well, it's a misnomer. What do they stand for? Well, they stand for Speaker John Bonner, Republican, said these guys are anarchists. They're sowing chaos. They are not part of the Republican Party in the sense of getting together with other Republicans. So the whole idea is that is that they really are serious troublemakers and they absolutely vote in a block. And they've given over $200,000 to my opponent. You know, you've had a lot of experience um, in the world with people that are not very good guys. And right now we have a lot of uproar all across the world and people are tired, they're exhausted and they're scared. Mm -hmm. What do you think you bring to the table as a congresswoman when it pertains to foreign policy? And what you've seen over your lifetime investigating? Well, I think uh, what I bring to the table is I've really seen a lot of things and met every kind of person you can imagine, from, from the uh, absolutely least fortunate person in a refugee camp uh, on the Kenya-Somalia border, or and also I've met some of the um, biggest criminals in the world, the people from the cartels in Colombia. I've met, uh, you know, Mafia people in, in uh, Italy and Palermo have looked at looked closely at Italian politics and the involvement of the mafia. And I've been in six wars, so I've really seen the full gamut. Where is that useful? It's useful because you have the ability to deal with anyone in the sense that you're not intimidated by people. And I think that's a real plus for Congress. There are a lot of people who go to Congress and they may know a little bit about or a lot about local issues, but they don't really know much about big national issues or issues of the United States and how it fits in to the, to the world. So when, when these big decisions are being made, uh, discussing the Iran deal, for example, or North Korea, or I, I have uh, enough background, actually a huge amount of background in these subjects, mm -hmm. to be useful. However, I will tell you that the committees I really want to get on I want to be on agriculture, mm -hmm. transportation, infrastructure. I want to be on oversight. It's, it's domestic uh, issues. For example, we were talking about uh, opioids. One of the reasons why I want to be on oversight is because I want to hold pharmace pharmaceutical companies' feet to the fire, not just on negotiating drug prices, which we desperately need here, but also because they've been pushing pills and the state of New York is going after them. Various states are suing, but I think we need to get involved in Congress in a big way because that has to stop. Well, how do you feel when President Trump and others call a group of women protesting an angry mob? How do you respond to that? I just burst out laughing. 
uh, I think that um, his treatment of women has been uniformly appalling. I think that's the best word yeah. for it. Yeah. And, but it's not just women. I mean, look what he's calling Democrats now. Uh, every name in the book. Mm -hmm. So we just have to wade through this. He is, he's a very spoiled kid. This is someone, he's, he's what we call a trust affair in. He's a trust fund baby, got all his money from his dad. He uh, went bankrupt six times and is engaged in, in a lot of uh, questionable things financially. So uh, that's our leader. Mm -hmm. But if he behaves that way with women, we just look at him as he's a, you know, he's a bit of a brat. <laughs> more than a brat. I'm going to ask you one more question before we do our roar here at the end. But what is the uh, most important piece of advice that you would give your granddaughter? Stand up. Stand up. When the time comes and, uh, and, and confidence, have confidence. My daughters have really uh, a lot of confidence and one of them came the other day to campaign with me. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful to see them hold their own and I think they're, they're passing that along to my granddaughter. I have two granddaughters and I see them as very confident, tiny young things too. Um, but I think that sense of confidence and the willingness to stand up, willingness to see that we are equal and we have to fight for that right. It, every generation has to fight again. We've seen this. My grandmother was a suffragette. So we have really? to fight again and again and again. And they called her an angry mob then too, right? Of course. Yes. Of course. It's an old con. <laughs> it's an old <laughs> con. So we just have to, um, and uh, we have to realize strength in numbers. And there are many women coming out on this campaign. It is so exciting. And I don't mean just in Charlottesville and Albemarle. I mean Franklin County, Appomattox, Halifax. It's women coming out. I'm really, really proud and excited about that. Well, Leslie, we're really excited about this race. We know your race is now really a toss-up. It is. So we need to get everyone out to vote for you, to vote for Oath for Common Sense. And I thank you all for joining me. This is Susan Platt, Platitudes, Find Your Roar. And Leslie, this is what I do at the end. <laughs>